Welcome to Atlanta Startup Village number 26. CBQ, how are you? <laughs> nice. We have five amazing companies presenting tonight. These five companies range from very early stage, bootstrap funded. We've got a couple seats over here as well for anyone. And we're excited because there's gonna be a lot of stories tonight. There's gonna be a lot of demonstrations of actual product. Who here in the room is here for the first time at Atlanta Startup Village? Sweet. Well, just to give you guys a, be a brief background on Atlanta Startup Village, myself, Kyle Porter, and the Sales Loft team went to Techstars Boulder back in 2012, and I think we've got some Techstars Boulder folks back in the back, Kevin and Matt. Yeah, there they are. And there was a big meetup there called Boulder Denver New Tech Meetup. Five companies presented for five minutes and it showcased the actual product, and then there were five minutes of Q&A. So we were like, hey, oh man, this is awesome. Atlanta doesn't have this. Let's bring it back to Atlanta. The first Atlanta Startup Village was in Hypopotamus. So they're an eternal sponsor, along with the Atlanta Tech Village, because they let us use this space every month to showcase five very promising startups with amazing entrepreneurs and teams behind them. We do have some core values, be nice, dream big, pay it forward, work hard, play hard, and these are all taken from the Techstars ethos. And it's a really special thing, so we're excited for everyone to be here. All the entrepreneurs here tonight are gonna get up, stay, up on stage, show their product, and really, really uh, let their heart out, which is, which is cool. Who here is drinking some beer? Yeah. Not just beer, free beer. <laughs> free beer. So, so let's give a quick shout out to our sponsors. We have New Relic. New Relic, come on down. You are the next contestant on The Price is Right. <laughs> New Relic, take it away. All right, thank you. All right, I got a quick question here. How many people in the room have a website or a web app or a mobile app? Anybody? Is it working right this moment? <laughs> Are you completely sure? <laughs> That's what we do. Uh, mobile monitoring, uh, mobile apps, websites, web apps. It's a service. It'll tell you who's hitting your site, when, what their performance was. And when it's bad, it'll tell you what's wrong. Why did it break? Why was it slow? Uh, was it a bad database call? Is it a weird browser they were using that you don't support? So um, we actually have a free tier. Um, so for starters, if you want to try it out, you can go in, log in. We got over 10,000 paying customers. We're actually a decent company, you know, um, <laughs> decent sized company. So um, that's what we do. Mobile app monitoring, uh, websites, web apps, APIs that kind of thing, keep it all running for you. Great, thank you. Is the Velocity team in the, in the house? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, come on down. Another big reason why the beer is free tonight, y'all. Take it away. Hi, so, oh, that was a great response. You've done this before. How many people have companies that are growing or changing? Raise your hand, since we're raising hands. All right, a few. So Velocin has been around about seven years. We're an IT specific recruiting firm. We hire all of your SDLC and infrastructure needs as well as an HR recruiting arm to help companies that are growing rapidly and need more than a few hires. So we've got a handful of great clients here at the Village. We also work with some large companies as well. And so we're here to help you guys in any areas you're changing or growing. Come find me, I'm Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. Clint, if you guys want to get ready, you guys want to get ready. All right, we are going to mix it up tonight. We do have something new, but it's not going to be until the end. And it's going to be a f six question quiz, probably isn't the right word, maybe survey, but there are going to be some surprises. We always like to mix it up here and you guys will enjoy it. It's very interactive and engaging, but the key is to pay attention because we've asked questions that revolve around
the web or the presentations. So, all right. And then lastly, before we start the presentations, let's give a quick round of applause to the team here at the Atlanta Tech Village. Karen, Aaron, Caitlin, Skip. Thank you. All right, we've got the Got a Golf team up, locked and loaded, so take it away. All right, thanks, John. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Clint. I'm the founder of Got a Golf, and this is Jesse, one of our co founders. So, at Got a Golf, we make it simple to plan and discover golf outings of any size, whether it's a large charity outing, a weekend trip with your buddies, or anything in between. So let me start by telling you how outings are currently planned. It starts with calling several courses to check on group rates and availability. Once you choose a course, you have to figure out who wants to play. And this is typically done via long email threads or in large outings via forms and flyers. You also have to collect payments separately from each golfer, making it hard to keep up with who's paid and who hasn't. Then finally split up all these golfers into pairings of four on paper or in Excel. And finally, gather all this information and send it to the course, at which point they manually input the players and the pairings into their outdated systems to finalize the tee times. So now I want to hop into the platform and show you how Gata Golf simplifies this process for everyone involved. So what you see here is a live outing that we've set up for April 15th. It's going to be a two-man best ball format, and we're hosting it up at Alpharetta Athletic Club. It's a great track and you're all invited, so if anybody's interested, I hope you'll come play. So first off, we make it easy to send invites and figure out who wants to play. We'll go ahead and invite Birdsong to join because I would love to beat a Georgia fan on my home course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when John comes to view this outing, he'll be able to see who else is playing as well as see activity from the outing. Now, if he decides he wants to play, he'll be prompted to pay for his round so that we don't have to chase him around looking for cash or create a long line in the pro shop. Now, once I figure out who all is going to play, we have a beautiful drag and drop interface where I can designate the pairings and start times for each round. Now, if you're in a hurry, we have an autofill feature uh, that will automatically set the pairings for you. So once the pairings are in place, you hit finalize rounds and we'll send a confirmation to all the players, letting them know who they play with and when they tee off. And we'll send the course all of the players and pairings in a format that can easily be imported into their existing systems. Then on the day of the outing, everyone can use the Gotta Golf app to seamlessly communicate, post scores and post pictures. The iOS version is currently in development and we'll be launching it early this summer. Now, as users create outings like this, we're gathering a lot of interesting content. So we also give golfers a simple way to discover what's going on around them. If you take a look here, you'll see a feed of everything happening in Atlanta. As we scroll through this feed, you'll see outings and rounds anyone can join, photos from the course, and much more. So, <laughs> so not only are we providing a powerful platform for the millions of organizers that plan outings each year, but we're also connecting the dots between these organizers, the 24 million golfers at play, and the 15,000 courses that host the outings. We've built our current platform and product roadmap in collaboration with hundreds of beta users and industry influencers. We're getting great feedback and we're excited about where it's headed. So before I wrap up, I have two big announcements. First, we're proud to announce that we're officially launching Got a Golf Beta in Atlanta right now. So pull out your phone, hop on gotagolf.com, and check it out. Second, to celebrate this launch, we're giving away a free outing at Bears Best for you and seven friends. When you sign up, you'll automatically be entered to win. We're also going to give away 500 Pro V1 golf balls to Atlanta golfers. We're going to start by giving away a few tonight, so if you see anybody in a Gata Golf tee, flag them down and grab your free golf ball. So to wrap things up, I want to say thank you to Johnny Bird and everyone at the Tech Village for putting this on each month. It's a privilege to get up here and share what we're working on with all of you. Last but not least, if anyone likes what we're doing and wants to get involved, I'd love to chat. We'd also love to speak with any investors 
who like what they see and want to work with a great team who's on a mission to disrupt the golf industry. We're ready to take this bootstrapped company to the next level. Thanks, enjoy the rest of the pitches, and I'll go ahead and take some questions. All right, All right good question. Um, so we have a couple, yeah, so the question is, what is a revenue model? Um, the good thing about golfers is that there's lots of ways to make money. Um, spend a lot of money and we can make money in cool ways. So uh, the first is whenever people create large outings of 80 or more, it'd be a one-time usage fee. So we charge you $99 to create the outing and run it on Gotta Golf. Um, second is whenever you book a tee time through the site, we get a 7% kick on that total fee. Um, and then the third revenue stream we're looking at is going directly to the course and giving them access to the platform for all of their members and guests. And that would be a monthly subscription fee. Good question. All right, anybody else? Yeah. So you can do both actually. Um, so you can hop on if you just wanna play with two or three friends, you can use it to manage that and figure out who wants to play or you can run a larger outing. So anything from four people to over 100 or over 200. Yeah. So the question is, does the auto grouping take into consideration handicaps? Um, it's a great question. Right now it does not, but we are planning to add that as well. So good question. All right, anybody else? Yeah, in the back. What's your marketing strategy? How do we acquire customers? Yeah, good question. So the question is, what's the marketing strategy and how will we acquire customers? Um, so there's a couple different ways. We're targeting city-based launches. So we currently have done our private beta here in Atlanta. Um, now we're in public beta, so we're scaling up. And when we look at actual customer acquisition, there's a couple ways. One is going direct to the organizer via Facebook, Twitter, and online channels. Um, so we find that guy, we send him to a landing page, bring him in. Um, the second is actually going to the golf course. So kind of a one-to-many approach. We partner with the golf course, and then we use that to provide the platform for uh, their members and guests. So those are two of the primary ways. Obviously, there's lots of other little ideas and ways we're going to work with it within, within that. Uh, but good question. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So the question is, are there any similar products out there in the market? Um, yeah, so there's some stuff that's pretty similar. So one of the things that we look at as competition is like a meetup.com, which you guys all use to come out here. Um, so your generic event planning sites, you know, people can hop on and figure out, you know, who wants to come. Um, but we see that we're able to differentiate by, you know, providing the golf specific things, the pairings, the scores, those kind of things. Um, as far as actually being able to plan golf outings, there's no one that's focused on a solution and gained any meaningful traction. Yeah, uh, so the question is, are we handling the payment portion? Um, and the answer is yes. So we'll integrate with Stripe, and through Stripe you can collect payments from everybody and then take the money out as the organizer. Yeah, really good question. Have we thought about going to any of the golf course management companies? And two examples are Troon and Club Corp. And the answer is yes. Um, we haven't yet targeted them, but we have contacts at a couple of those companies. And um, this summer, we're hoping to chart out into those conversations. Johnny. So currently, B2C, we're going to the consumer. Um, but whenever we shift into the golf course, market this summer, it'll be then both B2B and B2C. Good question. All right, any other questions? How many courses do you have in your beta program? That's a good question. The question is how many courses do we have in the beta program? Um, and so the way that we have it structured, we have every course in America in the database, so you can use the platform with any golf course. Um, we have three courses in Atlanta that we've worked with that have people playing regularly and are, are planning outings on the course. Um, so that's a good question. One more question? 
<laughs> Great question. Um, that's a tough question. That might be the hardest question I've gotten all night. <laughs> um, so I'm going to push the boundaries of Atlanta and say that my favorite course is Big Canoe, a little outside of Atlanta, but it's a great mountain course. Um, they have holes on the lakes, holes in the mountains, and yeah, highly recommend that. All right. Well done. Perfect. So in between presentations, we always have, these chairs obviously don't just unfold and organize by themselves. It takes volunteers, it takes a lot of work. And in between the presentations, volunteers have 30 seconds, true meritocracy here, to present and pitch whatever they want. So Mike Dayob, 30 seconds, take it away. Are any of you agonizing over big employee stock and option decisions? It's a good problem to have. Do it right, you lock in your kids' educations, retirement, freedom of where you work for the rest of your life. I lived through something like that, became a financial advisor, wrote a book, look me up on Amazon, Mike, Dayob, D-A-Y-O-U-B. If you want a free copy of the book, see me later. Atlanta Startup Village, love you guys. Start and something. Nice, very nice. Amazon, check it out, check it out. And if you guys are wondering how to spell his last name, it's D-A-Y-O-U-B. Longleaf, y'all take it away. All right, thanks, John. I'm Michael Williamson, the founder of Longleaf, and we are in, in the K-12 education market. So um, we are a data analytics company that's focused on helping uh, kids do better in schools. Just a, since we're an analytics company, I'm going to start with a couple of statistics about U.S. education. We spend $1.3 trillion in education, and some of the results are not so good. So about 7,000 Good. All right, so a couple, couple of stats since we're an analytics company. About 7,000 kids a day drop out of high school, one every 26 seconds. Reading, our most important skill that we'll learn in our whole life, two-thirds of eighth graders read below grade average, and they'll never catch up. And last but not least, teachers are our most important asset in education. 40% of them in urban areas are first year teachers, they're brand new, and one in seven leave education every year. So we have a lot of issues. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we, what we do to try to solve or help solve some of these issues. This was our first school we implemented in Boston, Massachusetts, Killam Elementary. It's a national blue ribbon school. And <clears throat> some of the, so what we do is try to use data and analytics to help predict what kids are going to struggle early, find those kids, and then intervene and provide interventions to turn them around. In seventh or eighth grade, if we can find those kids that are most likely to drop out, intervene, provide an impact, we know we have a better chance that they won't drop out. So this is the first school we went to, Killam, and they spent about four hours a week per grade level talking about interventions and this whole process of finding kids that need help. <clears throat> we spent weeks and weeks and weeks at the school, flying back and forth to Boston, meeting with their team, watching how they do it. And what we found is that, and the process is basically they take all the data that they know about these kids, attendance, discipline, test, grades, uh, homework assignments, they pull all that data together and they group the kids by 
performance level. And then the kids that are struggling, they talk about what they're gonna do for each one. What we learned in spending weeks with them is about 90% of the time spent was on the data, creating spreadsheets, running reports. Each teacher typically in our normal installation has 10 or 15 different products that they log into. So imagine doing your job with 15 different usernames and passwords, running reports from all these products, trying to put together a story. So they spent 90% of their time on that and only five to 10% on talking about what are we gonna do for these kids that are struggling. So that was our first kind of goal. So this is our, this is, we're looking at all students in second grade. <clears throat> the other thing about educators, they're very relational people. What they're great at is connecting with students. You don't think of them as analysts, st stats analysts. That's not who educators are. So one of the things that we did was really focused on the user experience of how to use this data and provide that as easy as possible. So we're looking at all uh, second graders. We can add all the performance measures, test. We integrate data from 10 or 15 different products. And then what this tool is really good at is sorting and filtering and grouping these kids. So we can say, let's sort by tardies. It's gonna reshuffle those cards and group them. So all of these kids have zero to five tardies all the way out to over 45. We can look at attendance. Dibbles is a reading test. So this is the score distribution. These kids did really good on this reading test. These kids struggled. So one of the things that we did, as you can see, is made it very easy for educators to use this data. If we wanna find out which kids are most struggling, we can say, show us the kids on Dibbles that scored below 220 on the beginning, still scored below 220 on the end, and had very little growth from one to the next. So they struggled on both tests and they didn't progress really at all over the whole year. So just a couple quick clicks, we're able to find these 10 students, which has saved hours worth of time in those data meetings. Now we can talk about what are we gonna do for these 10? We can now create an intervention, which is basically a template of what are we gonna do to help these kids read better? And so the district can put in targeted strategies of what we're gonna do over the next 60 to 90 days and implement those. So a personalized plan is, is um, presented and created for every one of these students. We also do a lot of other things like dashboards and other data visualizations, but our main value proposition is bring all this data together that's typically siloed, make it really easy to use to help kids, uh, help find kids and make them better. So we are, with all that being said, I'll take questions. Here's kind of where we are. Over the last two years, we've had rapid growth. We're in about 1,500 schools all over the country with about 50,000 users today. <laughs> question here. So who inputs the data? Great question. So. Uh, EdTech is very fragmented. There's tons and tons of products that are out there. Like I said, teachers are using 10 or 15 different existing products. So we don't replace any of those products or any of that investment. What we do is we harvest the data out of each one and just put it in one place. So we interface attendance data and grade book, assessment products. We, we do a lot of data integration to bring that together. Yes. Great question. This is so privacy of student data is a big issue in education. There's a lot of press on it almost every day. And the basic concept is we're collecting all this data. We know more about students than I would argue any other industry that exists. The amount of data that's collected on student performance is huge volumes. So we do have to protect it. So one funny thing is the, this data wall, which exists pretty much everywhere we go, every school's doing it in America, their solution to privacy is this curtain. <laughs> so at the end of the meeting, they close the curtain, the data is secure, 
And then the next meeting, they open it back up. So that's another value we bring. We really protect this data. We do a lot of things like encryption of data at rest. Of course, all the, we use the Azure Cloud, so all the built-in functionality around that. But there is, uh, just like in healthcare, we have HIPAA and education, there's FERPA, there's a lot of laws, and those laws are emerging. It's, it's a big topic. So the question is, how do we interface with IEPs and other um, systems like that? And how do, does it work for behavioral problem students? So what our product really is, is an IEP. We create the IEP from the data, which is an individualized education plan. So the holy grail in education is a individual plan for every student, a personalized plan. We're making the transition from a teach uh, lecture style environment in education to a very personalized um, experience and we're part of that transition so a lot of kids like special ed kids will have very detailed uh, written plans about accommodations we're going to make so we can import a lot of that data in or they can create and manage them in our product and then around behavioral a lot of the interventions in schools are other than academic so going back to those 10 students that have reading problems, we could sort by attendance and it would show that a couple of those students had 10 absences or more. So when you go to prescribe what you're gonna do for each individual students, you have to take into account the holistic view of performance. And that's why it's valuable to have all this data together. So uh, behavior interventions, attendance interventions, um, the big three predictors for dropouts our attendance, discipline, and of course, academic grades. So all that together predicts dropouts. Is there a that So one of the asks I would make is really appreciate what teachers do every day. They have incredibly difficult jobs. Um, but they do spend a ton of time on da entering data, analyzing data. The real problem that we're trying to solve is remove any time they spent analyzing data, pulling together, running reports, creating spreadsheets. They, for this six hour meeting, they used to spend, it kill them, five hours of that meeting just on analyzing data. Um, some teachers have spreadsheets to capture data. We've, we've eliminated all of that manual work and you can enter it directly into our product. So it's a, it's a big part of just streamline, streamlining their job. So did we build all this ourselves or did we uh, partner? And we built, we built the whole application from the ground up. We don't really use any third party, we use the .NET uh, Microsoft stack hosted on Azure. So we built it all native. Awesome. Before we bring up our next volunteer, move loot, move loot. Okay, yeah, if you guys wanna get ready. All right, House of Genius, come on down. 30 seconds. Thank you. Good evening. We all know that entrepreneurs must make countless decisions. House of Genius brings together entrepreneurs and a mix, diverse mix of collaborators from the community for an evening of disruptive thinking, supportive input, and creative new ideas. House of Genius is in 21 cities worldwide, and now we're in Atlanta. It's a fun, unique experience, and thanks to our sponsors, it's free. If you'd like to present, be a panelist or a sponsor, please come see Megan or myself in the back and look us up at houseofgenius.org. Together, we create genius. Very nice, nice pitch. And Michael, I know a couple of people had other questions. Are you gonna be around afterwards? Okay, great. Hopefully the keg isn't tapped out. All right, move loot, take it away. Great, thanks for uh, having us out tonight. Uh, my name is Drew. I'm the Atlanta Market GM for Move Loot, and this is Andy, our business development manager. We're a San Francisco based company um, that has been in Atlanta for all of three weeks since our launch. Uh, we started as a Y Combinator graduate 
back in class of 2014, and we're in four locations now, Raleigh, Charlotte, and Atlanta, as of three weeks. So quick question for the crowd here, who here has bought or sold furniture used online? Everybody at some point in their life has had to do it. So let's take a look at what the current model for buying and selling used furniture is, or the most popular model. It's a fairly um, graphically unintensive text-heavy interface that will kind of rhymes with um, eggs list. Um, so if you're selling your own furniture, here's how it works. You take some photos, you try and write some copy that's mildly entertaining to get attention out of the 900,000 other listings that are spam. Then, if someone actually likes your item, you've got to meet up with a total stranger, probably in your house, or in a parking lot, or in the alley behind Beltline Kroger. It's not ideal. Also with this method, frequently you're gonna to have to haggle over money. Someone's gonna to wanna to pay you less than what you listed for. No one's ever gonna to come to you and say, please let me pay more than what you have it listed for. Say you wanna sell everything in your living room, you get to repeat that process for every single item of furniture you have with a different person each time. The buying process, it's pretty much the same thing. Say you're looking for a side table. You get to endlessly click refresh in um, Rhymes with X list and look for a side table. Then you get to meet someone again, the whole total stranger process with cash in hand. And then you hope that the actual side table the person shows up with in their pickup truck looks like the picture they posted online. <laughs> so the process has a lot of problems. Where we come in as Move Loot is we try and solve those problems for both buyers and sellers. Use furniture market, even with all of those problems that what Craigslist has, it's still a $10 billion market for used furniture just on Craigslist. We think it's a huge opportunity for somebody to come in and make the process easier. So Andy is gonna actually jump right into our product and show you our website for how selling furniture works with MoveLoot. Thank you, sir. Appreciate y'all coming out. Um, as you can see here, uh, there are a few steps involved with the MoveLoot process, right? The first two are your responsibility. Own furniture. A, B, be willing to photograph that furniture and then submit it through either our app or our website. Swing on into moveloot.com and start selling. I've started a submission, that's what we call the selling process, right, for you. If you'll bear with me one moment. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna ask you for a few pieces of information. The first is the age of the item. The second is its relevant, relative condition. Good, excellent, poor, fair. Brand, if you know it, name, the original price you paid, what you want to get out of it, and the lowest amount of money you're willing to take. We take all that into consideration, and then you're done. You schedule a pickup time, we come with our movers, people we employ and insure, full-time employees with benefits, we swing by, grab it, take it to our warehouse, clean it, pack it, photograph it, ship it, and when it sells, you take 50% of the price. It's that simple. You get 50% of the payout for 0% of the work. It's probably the easiest thing I've ever sold. It's fabulous, right? Clean inspect, list it, paid, done. The buying is your basic e-commerce platform. You hop on MoveLoot, You shop, you see something you like, if there's any damage to the item, it will be noted, it will be photographed, it will be listed, add it to the cart, and you're off to the races. If the value is over $99, which 99% of everything on here is, delivery is free. Thanks, uh, does anybody have any questions for us? <laughs> yes, right there. Uh, is there any way that you can sell? Can you sell baby stuff? It's really hard to 
Absolutely. So the question is, is there anything we can't sell? Uh, we do not sell electronics, appliances, um, mattresses, typically uh, you know, linens, things that are going to be hard to clean or that come into contact regularly with people we don't sell. Right there. So do we think 50% is too high? Um, this is actually, that's a great question. It's one that we get frequently. Um, I Personally, I don't. Um, for the convenience factor of not having to borrow a truck, meet a total stranger in a parking lot or have them come into my house, line up a time to meet somebody to drop off or pick up furniture and not have them show up. Um, the service aspect that we're providing, I think, is well worth the 50%. Now, if you want to make the most money possible on your item that you're selling, we're not the site for you. Like, you can definitely make more money if you put in the time and effort on your own to sell your own item. Um, our target customer are people who just want to list it. It's out of your house and out of your hair within 48 hours of when you list it, and we store it while it's for sale. It's a great question. So if it doesn't sell, we list items for 60 days during the consignment period. Uh, at the end of 60 days, we email you and get in touch with you and offer you several options. We can ship the item back to you. Almost no one ever takes that because once it's out of your house, you really don't want it back. <laughs> Two, uh, we can lower the price and put it on a flash sale and try and get anything for it. Or three, we partner with local charities with our warehouse. We can donate it to charity on your behalf and send you the tax write-off information which is a pretty popular choice. About 80% of the items we list sell within the 60 days, though. Right up front. So what's your advertising on? Obviously, you with. Well, um, advertising, I, hopefully you'll get to see these around town, so we're using social media, but also uh, radio and print advertising to spread word of mouth. Um, so we have, actually right now, we have a lot of ads up in MARTA stations in the uh, center of town and north suburbs. Um, we've got radio advertisements for traffic and weather right now, um, pretty big launch into Atlanta advertising push. Um, yes? Right. Right, we, um, yeah, so the picture the person takes is for us to vet the item and make sure, I mean, we do turn down some submissions, i.e. if it's an Ikea chair that's missing a leg, we're not gonna sell that. Um, so that's just for us to vet. Uh, we, when we receive it into our warehouse, we have two photo studios set up where it's clean, professionally photographed. Um, we write clever copy for it. We try and put the, the item in its best light. We also do magnify any imperfections in the item. We're selling used items. We don't wanna hide anything from anyone. We wanna be representative of what it really is. We also have a policy that if we deliver the item to you when you purchase and it doesn't live up to what you saw on the site or you don't like it, we'll take it back. All the way in the back. How does it compare to eBay Valet? How does it to eBay Valet? Um, I have not personally used eBay Valet, so I will come talk to you after that and want to hear more about that. When does the seller get paid? So the seller gets paid within seven days of the item being purchased online. Uh, you can get a payment through Venmo. We can actually cut you a physical check. Or you can choose to... Um, be paid in what we call loot bucks, which is just internal site credit that you can use to buy furniture. You actually get a higher payout if you take internal site credit. Do you look at uh, estate sales? Uh, we have looked at estate sales. We actually, um, you know, a lot of our business development and, and sort of getting inventory into the site is working with uh, real estate agents, professional stagers always have more furniture than they know what to do with and have warehouses full of them and find that our site is sort of a godsend. Um, we have looked in, not yet in Atlanta, we've only been up for three weeks, but in San Francisco we've had some estate sales that have come to us and said, everything that doesn't sell during the sale, can we bring it to you in a truck and list it on your site and you sell it for us? And we do that. Yes, sir. I love that I've turned eggs list into a term now. This is awesome. Um, we do have data on that. I think we can talk a little bit more after this, but we do have data on that. And I think in general, um, as the site has progressed, we've started off with sort of a, the quality of items on the site and the prices have definitely crept up the longer we've been in business. Um, 
we started off taking pretty much anything, and now we're a little more selective about the price level and quality volumes that we take. Thank you very much, everybody. Douglas? Hey, what's up, Doug? 30 seconds. Okay. Hi, I'm Douglas McCroskey with Next Health Plan. We are a private health insurance exchange. The Obamacare enrollment season is over. So if you didn't get it or you couldn't afford to get it, uh, we can still help you get it uh, for you and your employees. Uh, coverage that they can afford, but more importantly, afford to use. So come see me in the back, get my card, get your next health plan. Thank you, Doug. Very nice. All right, I think we have the Startup Riot winner. Did you guys, did you guys finish first? Nice, nice. So this is good routine. Take it away. Uh, no pressure there. Good evening. My name is Andy Blackman. I'm the founder of South Fork. And in the next five minutes, I'm gonna tell you how we are changing the way people experience lunch. So I want you to indulge me for a minute. Maybe close your eyes. Imagine it's the middle of the morning. And inevitably you ask yourself, what am I gonna do for lunch? You want something different. Something that's not Jimmy John's. <laughs> so you get in your car, you drive 10 or 15 minutes, get out of your car, get in line, wait in line, go back to your office. By the time you get back to your desk, you realize that you just spent 45 minutes of your day just going to get lunch. Now imagine that you could have a delicious, chef-crafted meal brought right to your desk. That's South Fork. South Fork connects Atlanta's top food producers with people who work in office buildings. We're focused on restaurants that provide artisanal, sustainable, and local food. And it's simple, easy, and convenient. Let's do a quick demo here. Let's say you're going to South Fork for the first time. You simply type in your address, and if we deliver to your building, you click on View Menu. If we haven't activated your building yet, you can easily join our waitlist. Here you see the day's menu. You see three delicious meals, professionally photographed, all appetizing, and they're all between $12 and $15, and that includes tax, tip, and delivery. The beauty of this page is you can look at this page, click on what you want, and just check out right away, or if you wanna learn more about a specific item, you can do that as well. So you click through and you say, I really like this California collard green wrap. So here you can get some more details about the wrap. And what I should mention is that every day you get a notification at 9 a.m. telling you the menu of the day and you have until 10.30 to order. So up there you can see a clock telling you exactly how much time is left before you have to place your order. You see a little more about the pricing, a little more about the dish, you can see customer reviews of the dish, a description from the chef himself or herself, and the ingredients, and even some nutritional facts. The checkout process, super easy. You add it to your cart, go through the process. And for a new user, you just sign up right here, click through. We've already loaded your delivery details that you put in on the first screen. Just check out. Like I said, it's all included, tax tip and delivery, and there you go. But importantly, the experience does not end here. Immediately, you are given an email with confirmation details, then a text message when the food leaves the restaurant, and finally, another text when your food arrives at your office lobby telling you to come down, it's time to eat some food. It's that easy. So why am I doing this? Well, over the past six years, I've been obsessed with one question. How do you build a company that contributes to a more sustainable food system? It started at a hedge fund, where I was an agricultural analyst. It continued at my first startup, which I co-founded, where I worked with a number of brands. And then at Columbia Business School, where I was the president of the Gourmet Club, 
and founded a campus-wide food incubator. I've been thinking about this for a long time. So I'm excited to announce for those of you that work at the Village or nearby, tomorrow, as we do every Tuesday, and I'm going to try and zoom in here, we're going to be offering Rumi's Kitchen, one of the top Persian restaurants in Atlanta on the Eater 38 consistently. Just go to eatsouthfork.com and the discount code, you may not be able to read it, is just the village, and you'll get 20% off of tomorrow's order. And then finally, we've been piloting with a number of buildings throughout Atlanta. If you want us to feed your company, please email me at andy at eatsouthfork.com, or you just want to know when we launch, you can go to the website and sign up to get updates. Thank you very much. <laughs> Got a question in the back there. So it's basically just looking at how many people in the building are signed up. Oh, excuse me. Uh, the question is, how, what does it take to get off of the wait list? And our goal is to get into as many Atlanta buildings as soon as possible. So as soon as we have a few people signed up per building, we'll activate that building. Absolutely. So the question is, will we consider catering for office events? We are doing that a lot right now. Uh, if you have a sales meeting, if you are trying to add a perk to your team, kind of lunch as a service, if you will, we're there for it. You, we take care of every detail, so you don't have to do anything. Just email me, and I'm happy to set it up for you. Yep, so we are building a proprietary delivery system. So uh, both our compensation of our drivers and also the way that we route our drivers is all being routed in a way that's um, pretty efficient. Is there a vegetarian there are. Day? Yeah, so we are going to try. It's not a promise, but every day there'll be something that kind of fits every dietary preference. So gluten-free, um, dairy-free, vegetarian. Uh, so the way the question is how to select the supplier, uh, it's a little bit of just based on who the top chefs in Atlanta are, who we have relationships with, who our partners are. It's a very curated group. So really we're constantly going around and trying to say what, what do we think has both variety and is really great food and also fits our model. So there's a little bit of they have to have production capability, they have to have a catering group. But for the most part, it's really just the top chefs, as many of them who want to join the platform as possible. How do we make money? So if you know a little bit about the restaurant industry, volume is a big deal. So we can drive a lot of volume in a very short period of time versus other platforms may take up the entire day where you're doing onesie, twosie orders. So what we do is we go and say, hey, we can bring you bulk orders across an hour, and then we're out the door. And so we have deals with restaurants, and then we also build in a delivery fee into our price. No, the, the question is, uh, do the people who deliver, are they South Fork employees or do we use a third party? They are South Fork employees. Sure. So the question is, how do you position yourself against, against a Seamless or a Grubhub? So first I'll turn that, how many people know what Seamless or Grubhub is? Okay, so about 50%. So Seamless Grubhub, it's an online ordering platform where restaurants that actually deliver uh, will bring you food and there's a very tight vicinity and window. So we're actually working with a lot of restaurants in Decatur because we handle delivery. So the key difference between us and a Seamless, which are great services, we just have different providers. We're also artisanal, local, try and be sustainable, which that's not really Seamless's model. So the question is, how do you assign the drivers to each restaurant? So the way that it works right now is it's one restaurant per day marketed to our whole network of office buildings. Over time, as we think about who goes to, and we scale up and get more restaurants on the platform, probably it will just be through our algorithm, just like Uber, just ping them and, and different people, whoever's closest goes to different restaurants. Does that answer it? So,
Right, I mean, I think if you think about, so the question is how do you hire your drivers or find them? Um, I think that if you look at the, well, they, they work for us. So, so the difference is they may do other things. They may work for a different kind of, kind of on-demand workplace such as Uber at other hours. The difference is we guarantee them an hour of work and offer a high, high compensation and a percentage of the meals. Great, thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Kira? And then while Kira's up here, full story, if you guys want to get ready for the final pitch. Kira, take it away. Hi, I'm Kira Stein, a social media and digital marketing consultant with Dog Eared Social. Um, in my past, I have raised a quarter of a million dollars on social media alone. I have also worked with J. Walter Thompson, one of the largest advertising agencies in the world, doing social media for the U.S. Marine Corps. Um, I have packages for small businesses starting at just $150 a month. And I'm different from other social media consultants because I don't measure success based on your growth and your retweets. I measure it based on how social media has impacted your bottom line business goals. Come see me. I am serving you beer in that room. Very nice, Kara. Well done. All right. All right, Team Full Story. I know Derek Grant was planning on presenting, but he just had a baby. So we got second best, but I heard just as good. Maybe third best. <laughs> All right, take it away. All right, thanks very much. Uh, my name is Joel Weber. I am Derek Grant's understudy at Full Story. And uh, so basically, I've got this, we have a product that's a little bit difficult to describe sometimes. So I'm gonna say, we usually say it's like a DVR for your website or your web app. Um, who here has a website or app they are responsible for? That's a large number of hands. That's about what I expected. Um, everyone does, right? And who here thinks their UX is perfect? Ah, very bold man in the back there. I'm proud of you, and I look forward to seeing that site. I mean, the reality is that your user experience probably sucks. Ours does, everyone's does. It can always be better. And, you know, if I were to describe our mission in a nutshell, it is to make your user experience better. And it's not a trivial thing. It's not your UX designer's problem to make it better. It is not support's problem. It is not engineering's problem. It's everyone's problem. And um, so that is, uh, in a nutshell, that's what we are trying to improve. Uh, this, I had to put this up here because I'm so proud. You know you've really made it when your customers have made a drinking game of using your app. I'm quite proud of that. So um, first I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna jump right into exactly what it does. It'll be a lot clearer in a moment. But this is, this is the sort of home screen, the home page, if you will, uh, where the application is very user-centric. So you know, when you consider user experience, the first thing that you care about is your users. So what we have here, is this, is this is one of our customers, a customer called Relay Foods. They've been with us from the beginning. Great site, great app, but even they have problems. And uh, they've given us permission grace, graciously to, uh, to share their, to, sh to demonstrate their uh, organization. Um, so here we have a lot of users. I mean, it's very user-centric. We have, for each user, oh, Wi-Fi hiccup, that was frightening. Uh, you know, you, you were aggregating some data about that user. You have the various visits to the site, You've got um, data that they have published, that they've pushed into Full Story. So things like lifetime user count, uh, user count, or sorry, order count, uh, lifetime revenue, um, anything they care to push in. Also identifiers for their own, uh, for their own system so that you can work your way back to original users. And, uh, but for the real core of it is, really has to do with playback. So what Full Story does in, um, in a nutshell, uh, again, I'm gonna keep using that phrase, is it records everything that happens to your user on your site or your app. So I'm gonna start here with a session. This is recorded from a real full story user, sorry, real Relay Foods user. Um, what you have here, step to the side a bit, you have, this is on a, a mobile device, so it works beautifully on mobile. That's a big part of what we do. 
we have the events that they have that have actually happened. So these are the high level events. So we're recording what happened, but we're also analyzing deeply the, the details. In this case, the events, the DOMs, things you've clicked on, things you've interacted with, um, you know, so forth and so on, which we'll get more into that in a moment. But, um, you know, this is, uh, and if, if anyone's heard the term empathy machine, this notion that you, when you can really see what your users are doing, you get a really fundamentally different insights into uh, how they're experiencing your, your application, your site, uh, and where they're getting hung up in ways that, you know, analytics systems, Google Analytics, um, you know, Mixpanel and so forth, don't really show you. You don't, you're not just looking at data, you're looking at what people actually did. A few things to note here. Um, one, obviously it is, this is, uh, in, in, this is high resolution, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's incredibly detailed. This is not a video, we're not recording video. We can do this for every, every interaction on your site, up to you know, millions of sessions per month. Um, you know, you can, as I said before, you've got these events to the right, so you can tell that we're getting really deeply into the DOM structure of your, of your site and, and, and the detailed interactions. And of course, we have things like, because this can get kind of tiresome, you know, you can speed up the playback, you can skip an activity, so if users are, 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 are quiescent for a time, then you can, you can skip forward and so forth. Um, so that's the core of what we do. So, but because we are, we are because we are recording everything in, in great detail, deep into the DOM structure and so forth, and, and user interactions, uh, we can also do things like search. So, obviously, really simple things like name, I'm gonna presume that I know something about the experience of a guy named Todd here. And so here's Todd. Now this isn't rocket science, obviously. You, they have identified, really Boots has identified Todd as a youth. Was that five minutes? Wow, that was <laughs> terrible. Okay, I am going to continue this while I answer questions. I'll just have this playing in the background. You can get, get an idea of what's going on. <laughs> Start the front. So the question is, do we have, uh, we have things like Google Analytics integrated with this? So we are actually, I'll stop this for a moment. Uh, we are actually going into some detail on integrations. So we're working on, on analytics right now, Google Analytics specifically. Uh, we've done a lot of integrations with support products. You can see you know, user voice, Indesk, and so forth, uh, Help Scout. Uh, also, APM products like Bugsnag. I didn't get to show you this, but uh, somewhere in here, you can catch us doing things like recording console messages. That's pretty convenient when you're trying to debug a, a problem you're running app and so forth. Um, but there, you know, we, we have a, a very wide array of integrations that we're working on, and I think a lot of them are, are a lot more possible we haven't even considered yet. So what about the question about aggregation? Yes. Aggregation, sorry. So the question. Right. So um, I will use this opportunity to do part of a demo that I didn't get to do earlier. Thank you very much, sir. Um, so if you, if I go, the, the question is about aggregation. What do you do if you have 20 people or 100 people or 1,000 people doing the same thing over and over again? So I'm going to delete Todd here and go to a search. So one of the things I didn't get to show was this, we have this problem where on the Relay Food site, a, a user was experiencing a problem where they couldn't click the X. They have this modal dialog that pops up. And the, what you can do is search deeply into DOM structures and so forth. Use those, this, this is an instance here where you see someone's clicking, try, you catch all instances where someone clicked on this, on this selector. Take that. In this case, I'll show an, ex an example of what's happening in practice. Um, you're gonna have a bunch of users who have this problem. In this case, the site actually had this problem where the X, I don't know if you saw the first interaction there, but it doesn't actually work properly. So you can take those, those kinds of searches and aggregate them into segments. So I can say, you know, it showed me all users who did this, and it's actually kind of frightening that over a thousand people hit this bug today. Um, so you can build those, build those segments, share them with your team and so forth, and, and uh, we're working on, we have a lot more we can do on top of that, uh, but we're, we're just kind of scratching the surface of that process. Sir? How does this uh, affect the performance of the app? Like, I mean... Right, so the question is how does it affect performance of the application? Uh, we spend a lot of time profiling and testing. Um, typically we see if you do uh, Chrome profiles or Firefox profiles, you'll see in the order of 
you know, a few tenths of a percent of time spent in inside the full story reporting script. Um, we're very, very serious about it not infecting the performance of the application at all. And basically we do that by just testing a lot. Sir? Uh, so the question is about A-B testing. The, the answer is we, we're not doing A-B a testing ourselves. But we are uh, we we are working on or looking at integrations with uh, Optimizely and so forth. Um, there are a lot of things we could do with this. I mean, we're getting really deep into the stack of your of your application on the client. We could do a lot of things, but we're we're really pursuing a route of integrating wherever possible. So things like A/B testing, uh, you know, support, chat, that sort of thing. Sir. Right, so the question is what is, the, what is our target market? What kinds of businesses are we targeting? I mean, the short answer is anyone with a website. The, that's, that's, I know, that's a bit not over, overly pithy. Um, the longer answer is you know, people where user experience, or I should say companies where user experience really matters. So if you have a lot of sort of very brief drive-by users, that's not, not such a big deal. Although if you're a large e-commerce site, for example, you might really care about the usability of your, of your um, checkout page. For example, so you might you might aim for a small subset of the uh, of your users in that sense. I mean, not 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 the users themselves, but what you know the activities they're taking, but really more applications. And uh, we we spent a lot of time working to make sure that uh, Full Story works really well with very complex, very dynamic single page apps. In fact, Relay Foods you can't tell in this in this demo, but they their uh, their app is one gigantic, very complicated single page app. So we're, we're definitely aiming for the, the higher, comple higher complexity part of the market, if you will. Anything else? Oh, sir? What's your price? Uh, so we, we are currently charged primarily per session. Uh, the, very briefly, uh, it's, it is $150 to start per month, and that gets you up to, I believe, 25,000 sessions, and we work up from there. Thank you. Nice. Well done. We have two. So now we're going to do, normally we, we bring up one more volunteer. Where's the last volunteer? Martin? Hey. Marty? Martin? Hey, Martin. Cor Martin and Corey. You're Corey. Hey, Corey. <laughs> now we got that out of the, out of the way. Uh, um, all right. Raise your hand if you guys are out of beer. All right, so pretty good, pretty good. Um, well, I can't help that, but what I can do is I can tell you about our healthcare hackathon. I'm Corey the Canadian, and that's Martin the Magician at the back of the room. Uh, we're here from Forge Health, an Atlanta nonprofit that holds uh, healthcare hackathons every year. This year's event, April 10th through 12th at the Atlanta VA Medical Center. Uh, this year, we're focusing on healthcare challenges uh, with, the, with veterans. Uh, grand prize, $5,000 cash, and a $10,000 patent application. If you're interested, check out challenge.forgehealth.org, and that's it, bye. Corey and Martin, thank you. All right, we've got a, a, a new thing we're gonna do tonight. We're gonna try it out, the Get Voices app. We have a lovely Karen in the building. And we have six questions and two Octane gift cards. One goes to the person who answers the qu most questions correctly, the quickest. And then the other goes to the presenter the top presenter that everyone votes on. And that's it. So the first step is to call this number, 201-535-3100, extension 110. <laughs> Okay, so when you press start, okay. All right, we'll give you guys another 30 seconds. It's gonna be six questions, there's gonna be some multiple choice, and there's two Octane gift cards. Okay, once you call in, you don't have to hold the phone up, you just dial, you just press. Uh, you want the number pad, aha. Number pad. Number pad. 
All right, 120-ish. Should we, should we go? 130? All right. 150, all right, 150. <laughs> Long distance. Yep. Friendly human, thank you again for recording tonight, by the way. All right. Okay, we're not storing anyone's phone numbers. All right, let's get going. <laughs> okay, go ahead and use the numbers on your phone to answer. Faster answers equals more points. Question one. Is this your first time to Atlanta Startup Village? Time's up, 47% yes, 52% no. Longleaf sells into what market? Transportation, education, communication, or financial? Come on, y'all, this is easy. All right, time's up. Is Gotta Golf B2B or B2C? Come on, I asked this question. I asked this question. This one's a free one. <laughs> Oh, BDC. Number four. Which state is Move Loot not in? California, Texas, Georgia, North Carolina. Not in. And they did mention it. They did mention it. Oh, time's up, Texas. Number five. South Fork delivers lunch from? One, your favorite fast food, your favorite grocery, or your favorite chefs? Nice. Number six, all right, this, this one goes to the best pitch. Which pitch captivated your attention best tonight? Uh, uh. <laughs> Long leaves leading, time's up. Oh, nice. All right, let's give the presenters a round of applause. And the winner with 3,057 points. Oh, you get a text. Who, who won? Who won? Where? Oh, nice. Well done. And Longleaf, y'all come on up. What's your name? What's your name? Dan Houck. Dan, you're, you must have gotten really good grades in school. <laughs> well done. All right, y'all. Atlanta Startup Village, number 26, a wrap. And we will see y'all next month. <laughs>